Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's a good time for us to, to get started. Uh, we have a special privilege this evening um, of having uh, Professor Adam Cohen, who's uh, a local treasure of ours in the Jewish community, a Jewish scholar. Um, and he's going to be sharing with us his wisdom tonight about the illustrated Haggadah throughout Jewish history. I'd like to also acknowledge the presence tonight of Rabbi Eli Cohen, the rabbi of the Kiever Synagogue, um, which uh, Professor Cohen is a member, and I believe you're, are you the president of the shul? You're yes, the indeed. president of the shul as well. And so it's an honor and a privilege for us to be able to partner with the Kiever Synagogue. We don't often intersect because Kiever is all the way downtown and we're all the way on the north part of the city. And so I wanna thank them for uh, partnering with us tonight. Uh, and finally, what the before I pass over the mic, I would like to thank um, the the Genesov family, uh, Leon and Elaine Genesov, for sponsoring tonight's talk in memory of Elaine's parents, Avraham ben Shol Halevi's uh, Zichrona Livracha, and Rachel Batsvi Hirsch Zichrona Livracha, Abe and Ray Libo. May their neshamas have an aliyah. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass this on now over to our uh, co-chair of adult education, Michelle Jacobs, who will introduce our speaker tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Karabkin, and welcome to everybody who's joined us this evening from the different uh, shuls. I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Adam Cohen. Uh, he is the associate professor in the Department of Heart History at the University of Toronto and currently serves as the undergraduate director in the Anne Tannenbaum Center for Jewish Studies. He is a specialist in the history of European illuminated manuscripts from the Middle Ages and has published numerous books and articles on both Christian and Hebrew subjects. His most recent scholarly work is Freedom and Slavery in the Sarajevo Haggadah. And for the general public, Signs and Wonders, 100 Haggadah Masterpieces, A History of the Illustrated Haggadah. Professor Adam Cohen lives in Toronto with his wife, Linda, and is the president of the historic Hebrew Shul in Kensington Market. Thank you so much, Professor Cohen, for joining us. We're really looking forward to the lecture this evening. Thank you, Michelle, for the generous introduction and, of course, to the Geneso family for sponsoring this event. I'm especially grateful for Rabbi Karopkin's warm words at the top of the event. The by it stands as a beacon for Orthodox Jewry, not only in Toronto, but in Canada more broadly and even North America and beyond. And to have even the small association with the Bayit, I'm grateful to all of those who, who made it possible. And I hope that I will um, satisfy your, your curiosity and your interest on a subject that is near and dear to my heart. It is now time for the obligatory statement where I say, I'm going to share my screen and hope that this works. I hope that everything is clear. Okay. So before I launch into my conversation with you, I, I, I do have to issue my, my standard warning. You know, university professors are used to be, used to be giving two and three hour lectures. So I hope that you're all very comfortable because this could go on a while. No, I promise it, it won't be that bad, but I do tend to get carried away. And um, you know, I, I beg your indulgence in advance if this goes a little longer than you might have expected, but I'm imagining about an hour um, with of course time for questions and discussion. Um, I will not be monitoring the chat box. So I encourage you, if you have a question, feel free to write it when it occurs to you in the chat box, but I may not see it right away. Um, and M Michelle, you're welcome to interrupt me and 
say, oh, you, there's a really important question you need to answer in the chat box and I'll turn my attention to it. Otherwise, we'll just save them up for the end. Perfect. So let me tell you um, a, a mm -hmm. little bit about my own background. I came to Toronto in 2003. I'd been living in Washington, DC. I'm originally from New York, but I got a job at the University of Toronto and we came here and I, as, as Michelle said, my specialty was essentially Christian illuminated manuscripts of the Middle Ages, which you say to yourself, what's a good Jewish boy doing studying such a topic? And, um, you know, the long and short of it is that, you know, in a way, either you study yourself or you study the other. And this seemed to me about as different from who I was, who I am. And it, it was just fascinating. Um, but during my first sabbatical in 2010, I, I spent the year in Israel, not just to, to be for the record, um, you know, all throughout my university life, my graduate studies, I was Shomer Shabbos, Shomer Kashras. Um, you know, I think I was pretty good in, you know, not speaking too much Lashon Hara. So, you know, I tried to be a from Yid, um, studying this very Christian subject. But at a certain point in my life, during the first sabbatical in 2010, I had the schus to spend the year in Yushalayim. And I came to know Matthew Miller. And at that point, I was doing a lot more learning. And I was thinking, okay, I'm really good at this art history business, but how can I turn it to something Jewish? And I went to him with several ideas, um, including a book about the history of the illustrated Haggadah. And Matthew said, of your three ideas, that's the best one and I'll publish it. Baruch Hashem, um, that's what happened. And a mere eight years later, the book finally came out in print. And I tried to bring my perspective as an art historian to the rich history of the illustrated Haggadah, which emerged as a phenomenon around the year 1300. So after the time of Rashi, Ramban, Rambam, right, before. So, so in the time of the Rishonim, not the earliest generation of the Rishonim, but sort of the, the second, third generation you know, stage of the Rishonim, but before the Achronim just to situate you. And I decided to write it from the Middle Ages up until the present by selecting 100 representative examples. Now, you all know that there are hundreds, thousands of Haggadahs, right? And this is just, these are just the ones that are owned by the University of Toronto, right? I mean, you know, and why the University of Toronto would have a whole collection of Haggadot is itself an interesting story, but it seemed like a good visual to just get that sense of hundreds of Haggadot, right? And even illustrated versions, right? Which you may or may not use at your own Seder. It's a conversation for another time. Um, even if you limit the history of Haggadot to those that are illustrated, there are still hundreds and hundreds and hundreds from which to choose. And there are so many ways to tell the story of the history of the illustrated Haggadah. So in my book, I tried to do, uh, to do it one way. And um, when I have the, the opportunity to give talks like this, I, I always think to myself, who's the audience? What what angle is going to be particularly meaningful for them, right? Because some people are interested in topics like freedom or some want to take a deep dive on the Arba Banim, the four sons, right? And there are so many different ways to 
slice the pie. So I thought for the buy it, this is a hush of an audience. It's a bunch of learned people. Um, they're people who know what a Rashi is. They, they learn Gemara. So I'm going to craft a talk that I call pictures as perush. And I'm going to presume that you know, a lot of the basic concepts, I certainly, I, I have to presume that everybody here knows the Haggadah inside out. And you know, they don't need to be told what Magid is and you know, what the different symbolism of Maror is. But what I do hope to be able to reveal to you is different ways that people primarily in the Middle Ages, which is the material I know and love best, but not just in the Middle Ages, the way that the artists and the users took advantage of the medium of art to add additional information. Because we have to operate on the presumption that anytime somebody takes the trouble to add a picture to a Haggadah or any other book for that matter, they want it to do something, right? It's added value or is it value added? I, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm not so good with marketing. Um, but they want, they, it, first of all, costs more money to do it, right? And you know, it's more technically challenging to get the layout right and so on and so forth. So they really want it to do something. So I hope that in the next 45 minutes, I will present to you just a, a taste of some of the examples that were that that demonstrate the value that people in the past put in pictures and you know I'll, I'll give away the punchline it's it's my hope of course that you you will be inspired that in your own seder that you will take advantage of the multiple options there are for illustrated Haggadahs to perhaps incorporate pictures into your own Seder experience. Okay, so, all right, so it's back in 20, so we're back in 20, 2010, and I say, okay, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start working professionally on Haggadot. So what do I do? Of course, the first thing I did is, well, all right, the second thing. The first thing I did is I looked, I made sure of what books were already out there on the subject. But then I went on amazon.com, uh, um, uh, .ca. Oh no, I had already done it before. No, it's before 2010 because I was already, I was still living uh, in the States. Anyhow, I had bought like this lot, like, you know, 150 Haggadahs for $50. You know, it was just a total uh, smorgasbord. You know, it's, you know the, I didn't know what I was going to get. Right? It was like, um, love deal. well, never mind. Um, and one of the Haggadot in there, it's not a particularly, I mean, you can see it's in, in cruddy shape. It's not famous for any particular reason. Uh, it's published by a publishing house called Yeshurun in Warsaw in 1924. Now, just by the by, before we even open it up and look at the picture, right? the fact that I, I, I think it's fascinating the kinds of little historical tidbits you get out of unexpected places. And again, maybe this is the kind of historical um, tidbit that you know, but you know, it, it was a revelation to me that a publishing house in Warsaw in 1924 would be publishing a version of the Haggadah in English, which clearly is not for the local market, right? But they know that they're going to be sending them to America. Um, and so, you know, it tells you something about, you know, commerce and the connection of Jewish publishing um, and markets in the early 20th century. Okay, so you open up the Yeshurun Han, um, with the Yeshurun Haggadah. Um, and right at the beginning, it's time for the, the first kos. 
right? We're going to say our first bracha, bracha Hashem, al kenu machalam, bari priya gafen, right? So there it is in Hebrew at the top. I hope you can see my cursor. Um, then there it is in the English tradition. Here we have an engraving of Rosh Paro Ramses Hasheni, right? The head of Pharaoh Ramses II, right? So it's a little bit of a, an archeological uh, insertion, right? And, and keep in mind that 1924 is just two years after Howard Carter had gone and uncovered the tomb of King Tutankhamun um, in Egypt. So, you know, Egypt mania was running wild throughout the world. And, you know, people were thinking in terms of archeology. span So here we have this pseudo archeological drawing of the head of Pharaoh. But then down below, what do we have? Right now I wanna to go to the chat box. I wanna see how, how, how learned people are. Right now, there are two ways you can get the answer, either by the picture or by the caption. I, I think Karen gets it. Paro nitztara, brachatz bidmei yiladei Yisrael. Pharaoh was leprous and he washes in the blood of the Jewish children. As Karen says, yikes. <laughs> um, so now, of course, I, as an art historian, immediately say to myself, wow, where does this image come from? Right? And it's not hard to find because I know I know with just a little bit of research that Haggadahs that were printed in Europe from about the year 1700 until well into the 20th centuries tended simply to copy earlier engravings because it was cheap, it was easy, they weren't under copyright, they didn't have to pay artists, right? They didn't they didn't have to think too hard about it. They just had to hop whatever was already, um, whatever was there. Yeah, Cheryl's asking about the 90 beak pictures, right? Which obviously is not even spelled correctly. Um, so yes, they're writing it for the English audience, but the, their editorial acumen leaves something to be uh, desired. And I have to confess, um, I, I once had figured out what the beak pictures were, but I, I just can't remember off the top of my head. Um, um, so I'm going to say that it has nothing to do with Parish, so I'm just going to I'm just going to skip over that, <clears throat> and I hope you'll uh, indulge me. Okay, so it's not hard to find that in fact the source of the Warsaw Haggadah picture of 1924 goes back to the one of the earliest printed Haggadot, the Venice Haggadah. Big, big, big pictures. Yeah, it's probably big pictures. No, not bleak. No, most of them are not bleak, Miriam. Um, I think Jeremy's right. Beak. They're big pictures. Okay. Um, so the Yeshurun scene comes from the famous Venice Haggadah of 1609. Um, and here you can see it. I'm showing you the whole page. Now, unfortunately, I, I don't have a very sharp image of this particular page. So I'm bringing you another page from the same Haggadah, which at least has the advantage of having sharp resolution, right? And it's wonderful. It's always, you know, the next time you spill wine on your Haggadah, you, should, you shouldn't feel so bad because people have been doing it for literally hundreds of years, right? So here's one of the 1609 Venice Haggadahs. You can see the wine, uh, you know, I assume that's wine. It could be haroset stains. Who knows, right? So, the one of the things that the Venice Haggadah did is it's got all the text. It's got uh, Parish on the side. It's the Atzli Ash, but and then it has these pictures on the bottom and sometimes on the top. And in one of those, it is Paro bathing in the blood 
of the Jewish children. Now, okay, fine. I fit, told you where the visual source is, but what's it doing there, right? And so the answer ultimately is rooted in the text, right? And so here, right, you all know uh, Shmos base, right? And after that, the king of Egypt died and the Israelites were groaning, right? And the scene here in the Venice Haggadah is part of the Magid section where it says that the Jews were crying out, right? And that they were oppressed by Paro, right? But that's not enough. We have to go first to Rashi, of course, right? Who tells us, you know, like, which was the king? What did he, right? How could the king forget? And it, it wasn't actually, he, it wasn't a new king. It just, the king died, which means he was stricken with leprosy, Saras, right? And he brings the uh, Midrash, right? So Shmos Rabbah, and here it is in the text that tells us that, right, we know from the case of, um, uh, the case of Uziahu, right, um, that we have the, um, we know that leprosy is considered a kind of death, right? So when it says the king of Egypt died, he didn't die, he had saras, he had leprosy. And his Khartoumim, his magician said, you know, the way to get rid of the leprosy is to bathe in the blood of the Jewish children. And that's why he said, you know, go, you know, kill the children. Okay, fine. So I get it in the case. I understand why they do it in the Venice Haggadah. They put it, the, the Rashi and, and the Medrash tell us that it has to do with the king of Egypt and the groaning. Okay, fine, I get it. But what's it doing here? on this first page, or the very early page of the Warsaw Haggadah. So we have to go to the Gemara and, you know, it's so good. A, a lot of what I, I get to talk about tonight um, comes from uh, Maseches Psachim and, you know, those, those of us, and I confess I do not include myself in this, those, those of us who are learning Dafyomi are in these pages of the Gemara right in these weeks. And so it's all very fresh in your minds, but I'll bring the necessary text for, for those of us who are not learning Dafyomi, right? So the Gemara talks about the, the requirements around the wine, right? And it says that you should have red wine, right? And why should you have red wine? Um, and it says, it, it brings a Pasuk from Mishle, Proverbs 23, 31, right? adam, right? Look not upon wine when it is red, right? And so, and so you're already hopping the, the connection that's going to be made here. The earliest reference that makes the thing that you know that I have found, and you know, if Rabbi Kropkin or anyone else, Rabbi Cohen, anyone can point me to an earlier source, I'd be grateful, is the Orzarua, who Rav uh, Yitzchak ben Moshe Vienna, who lives in the 13th century, who comments in his Hilchos Pesach, he's going through all of the laws of Pesach, and he comes to this uh, bit of Gemara, and he says, Right here, Yain Kiyat Adam, Barve Psachim, da la 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 la. He said, I, I can't even I can't even read my own uh Lafiab Shat Alter um uh Lafiab Shat Alter Alter Out Al Tirani Shani Bagan Yain Adom Zecher Lidvar Shaya Paro Shoche Tinokot Kishinitz Tara. Right? It's to remember the blood of the Jewish children that Pharaoh had killed in order to bathe in it when he was a leper, when he died, right? And so the Orzarua makes this connection. Why do we drink red wine? Because among other things, it reminds us of this episode from the Medrash that Rashi brings and is, you know, embedded in the, um, Gemara, but is not made explicit 
so much in the texts. Um, and even in the Venice Haggadah of 1609, it's not making that connection explicit, but it comes together, I, I don't wanna say very beautifully, but it comes together in the example of the Warsaw Haggadah of 1924, when we open the Haggadah and we say over the first cup, the picture is telling you, remember Pharaoh, we can even give him a name, we'll call him Ramses II, and remember the blood. Now, Karen, I would not be, I would not be uh, distressed if you once again wrote yipes in the chat box. Um, um, but, you know, it, I always say, I don't write history. I just report it, right? So I didn't make the 24 Haggadah printed on paper. I didn't make the 1609 Venice Haggadah uh, printed on paper, although there are one or two luxury copies on, on uh, parchment, but they're quite exceptional. Um, and, um, you know, I didn't write the Arzurua. So I'm, I'm just showing you, but I hope that this first example shows you how the pictures have a lot, right? At first we looked at this picture and we're like, oh, you know, what's going on there? But it turns out there's a lot of Parshanut behind it. Now, did everybody who opened the 24 Warsaw Haggadah know the Orzarua? Did they know the Gemara? I'm not gonna speculate that they did, but somebody had to have the idea to put these things together. And I think we can, can appreciate that. Okay, let me turn to um, a, another medieval Haggadah, late medieval Haggadah um, made in Nuremberg in Southern Germany in the middle of the 15th century. And it shows us lots of good stuff. Um, you can see it, it's not in the best shape. I mean, it's been through a lot in, over the last 500 uh, years. 500, 550, you know, now you see why I went into art history and not engineering. Um, there are, the, I'm, I'm gonna point out three kinds of pictures in the what we call the second Nuremberg Haggadah, because there's another medieval Haggadah from Nuremberg, but th don't let that uh, get, get you hung up. So again, I'm gonna ask you in the chat box to tell me what you think these pictures are showing. And you can read the text. You see, I know you can all read the text because that's what you do. You read Hebrew, right? 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 Again, we're in the Magid section. So somebody follow Cohen's first rule of art history. When you don't know something, just say what you see, because you're probably right. And usually the obvious thing gets you where you're going. So you can even, un if it's easier just to unmute yourself and speak it out, do that, or type it in chat box. Is that a coat of arms on the monster? Okay, so already, Jeremy, first we have to say, we have a monster. Um, all right, so there's a monster. Coat of arms, I don't think, I, I see why you say it. I don't think it is. I think it's just, it's kind of wing, but it's an interesting idea. So I'll, I'm going to think about that, to be honest. I, I don't think so. Okay, Jeremy, thank you for, for being willing to play the game. Um, I, I, I presume you're familiar with the Haggadah. Do you remember any? Could it be a dog? Could be a dog. I'm thinking Haggad, yeah, that's the first thing, even though it's not the right, the dog eats the cat, you know, the dog's got his right. mouth on a man, but that's right. what came to my head. Right, plus we're in the middle of Magid, so that's probably not where I, I would go. Ah, here comes Mark. Uh, Oh, Mark, we got a real, a real uh, ringer here with uh, Mark, right? He's looking at the second image and he sees, right? 
he sees that what's going on here, right? You, you see, I, I, we, we should have said maybe this uh, lecture is not suitable for children because there's, um, yeah, you know, there are anatomical parts here in the in the Haggadah, which, you know, I assure you the people who, as you will see, the people who owned and used this were very from people. They had no problem with Gershom being shown with Sipora giving him the bris mila, right? And the Midrash says that in the episode, and I, and I had all the texts, but, um, you know, if anybody wants the texts, I can supply them to you. The, the bottom line is there's a Midrash that says Moshe was swallowed up by a monster. And the monster swallowed him until the point of the Mila. And that's how Tzipora knew, ah, oh, why is Moshe getting attacked? Because we didn't do Mila on our son while we're going down to Egypt. So then she gives him and they continue on down the road and then our own uh, Moshe meets our own and you know the rest of the story. Now, um, Mark, you're so smart. Where is this in the Haggadah? Miriam when, knows when to shake were, her when head. They were, when they were traveling back to Egypt, well, on the road to Egypt. In the, you, you and I must use very different Haggadahs. So, I've never seen this text in the Haggadah. No, no, that's when it's in the Torah. Ah, ah but I asked in the Haggadah. Where is it in it's the not. Haggadah? It's, it's not. not, right? I, I set you up, obviously, and you knew I was doing that. So, I, I, again, thank you for playing along. Right? Obviously, we know it's not in the Haggadah itself, right? And here, another, I'm sorry, this one isn't uh, quite as sharp. You all remember the story in the Haggadah, um, right here, the tower, the, 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 man, the, the man locked up in the tower and the woman who brings him food, and then afterwards, released from the tower and then the, the minstrel sing and they have a chuppah and there's a wedding, he gives a ring, all right? You all know this story in the Haggadah? No, no, but you do know the story, all right? What is it? Oh, I'm so glad that you're looking puzzled. It really makes me feel very good um, to know that, that the medieval Haggadah makers could, you know, stump you a little bit. Looks like I mean, that's why they did it, right? What? Rapunzel? It's a version of Rapunzel, but who are the dramatis personae? Who are the actors in it? I mean, we're in the Haggadah. Rebbe Mayer. Ooh. Um, I, Rabbi Cohen, you're going to have to tell me. Uh, there's obviously a Gemara that I don't know about Rebbe Mayer. Um, no, it's Moshe, of course, and Sipora. Right, Mayor Rotenberg. <laughs> um, right. So again, there's a midrash that tells us that that um, uh, Yitro didn't want Sipara to marry Moshe, and she, he put him in a he put him in a in a locked castle, and Sipara brought him food, and eventually he got out, and they got married, just like it says in the Agata. Right. So the point is, of course, that yes, we have never seen this in a Hagada. Um, and it's a relatively obscure medrash, but the point is that the Haggadah artists, and here, we'll just go back, uh, and I'm actually going backwards in the Haggadah, right? Because, so here's, you know, the, the uh, circumcision, here's the wedding, and then one before it is, uh, he, here's Moshe, he's out, and... Um, you know, he's going to, you know, he, he uh, it's the uh, shepherds and he goes to the well, right? Um, and that that we are more familiar with. Is it so a me, feminist Haggadah? I mean, we've got these Tzipora really featuring. <laughs> um, well, it fits into a larger pattern, which will be familiar to you probably, of Haggadahs that are dissatisfied with the general absence of Moshe Rabbeinu in the Haggadah text, right? And it bothers them, right? Because we know Moshe is right in the middle of the story. So 
many, many, many Haggadahs put Moshe in. They find ways to put him in. Now, this particular one does it in a way that's a little off the beaten path, but it's part and parcel of this broader phenomenon of trying to restore Moshe to his place. And he's, and you can't do it in the text, right? Because, you know, we're not going to change the text of the Haggadah. You know, you know, what, what are we? But in the margins, we can play, we have free reign as it were, right? And we can expand on the story, right? You know, whoever, you know, increases telling the story is Mishubach, is praiseworthy, right? And this is a version of that. Okay, but it's not, I, I don't want you to think that the second Nuremberg Haggadah is just full of uh, Midrash. Because in the very first page, there's also a, 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 a there, there are several pages, but here are two facing pages that are concerned very much with halacha. Right, and it's clear because not only are there the pictures, but there are also, as you already saw in the Moshe ones, I didn't, I didn't read all of the captions, but here, all of the captions, I printed some of them down at the bottom. And, um, you know, here, we're at the beginning of the Haggadah. It, we haven't even gotten to the Seder yet, but, you know, we all know that Pesach doesn't start at the Seder. We know that there's a little preparation beforehand, right? So one of the things you have to do is B'dikas Chametz, right? And so here is the picture of the man in the house, and he's got his candle, and he's got the thing where he's going to, you know, get up all the uh, chametz. Here's the wife, and she's got the, the, the broom, right? And down below, um, right, what's going on here, right? Again, you, you can, you know, those of you who want the Gemara language, because this is taken right out of Meseches uh, Psachim, it's right out of the Gemara. The Talmud tells us um, by the light of a candle and not by a torch, right? So he's got a candle, right? Or it says, and this is what it says right here, in the cellar, one searches the upper as well as the lower shelves. And um, then also it says in the yard, there is no need to search. Why? Come on, who's learning Dafyomi? The ravens will eat the chametz. The ravens will eat the chametz, and there they are, right? So the picture combines with the text, right? Now, the truth is you could have just the text, right? But it's more vivid when you have the picture, right? It makes it come alive. Um, now, I don't think it's meant to be a kind of visual shulchan aruch, right? You're not supposed to say, Oh, okay, I see that this is what, I mean, if you're already looking at the picture, you already know the halacha, right? But it, 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 it gives it presence in the Haggadah that this is the halachic way that we follow, right? It, it, it embodies it, it, the fancy academic term, it instantiates it. Okay, now one more. This is also this is also somewhat halachic, but you'll see um, uh, that it goes a little beyond that, All right? So here we have the people are making the matzah, and the captions tell us they do it begil bechedva v'ditzo. They're happy and cheerful and merry, right? They're really delighted that they can participate in the mitzvah of making the matzah, right? And so here. They are in the front, and you can see that the, the, woman, the women are involved, and the, the boys are involved, the young men are involved, here's a young man involved, here's a woman involved. You know, I don't know if you want to, you know, learn anything out of this. Again, I'm just showing you that there's a sense that, you know, making matzah in mid-15th century Germany is a co-educational experience, and I know that co-educational 
activities are very much on the mind of this Haggadah maker because what's going on in the bottom, and I, I love, I, I, this is just one of my favorite, favorite episodes in the whole history of the illustrated Haggadah. What's happening? What, what, start, me, start me off with the easy part. They're baking the matzah. Mm -hmm. Who's baking the matzah? I see a man. I'm not sure if I see a woman. Yeah, it's a man and a woman, okay. which you can tell by their, their clothing, right? Okay, who are these two people and what are they doing? Now, I'm, I'm sorry, it's not the clearest shot, but this is a Haggadah that's owned in a private collection in London. And I mean, the fact that we have such good pictures is amazing. Right. So Samuel or Shmuel Silverberg says they're eating the matzah. <gasps> no, they're, Jeremy, it, it looks like they're drinking, but in fact, um, uh, Reb Silverberg is quite right. They're eating the matzah, right? And the caption says, and the woman is, look, she's pointing up. She's saying, you, you, you trumpenics, right? And here you can read it in the Hebrew, what she's saying. I'll just translate it uh, for, for uh, everybody. See all of you and observe these two. The matzah is still between their teeth. Right? They're obviously sneaking off and eating it while it's being baked. And it, the caption goes on, in secret, before the Seder, they eat the matzah, like those who consummate their marriage in the house of their father-in-law, meaning already before the wedding. Right? And Rabbi Kelman talked about this. Now, this is, where does this come from? This is a Gemara, but it's a Yerushalmi, right? It's... Um, it's in Psachim, but in the in the Jerusalem Talmud, not the standard Babylonian Talmud. So two things I think emerge from this. It's very clear that the people who used this Haggadah were very learned. They knew their Gemara, they knew their Halacha, right? Um, they knew their Midrash. I think I think that he also had a sense of humor, right? Because there are um, not a lot of, um, there are not a lot of pictures of this. If you go through the whole history of the illustrated Haggadah, you don't see a lot of uh, pictures of boys sneaking off to eat the, um, uh, the matzah and getting yelled at by the, by the um, uh, balabusta. So, um, I, I think this is a, a delightful image that gives us kind of snapshot into daily life, but obviously daily life is structured through a, a like a Gemara worldview, right? It, it's a halachic worldview, right? But that doesn't mean you can't also have a sense of humor. Now, it's possible to interpret it in other ways. That's, that's how I, I like to interpret it. Um, oh, there. Oh, okay. So, uh, onward, in Psachim. And this is great because this year it's our issue, right? When the Seder comes, Motzi Shabbos, right? What's the order of the things you do, right? And here's the Gemara in the original and the translation. Now, it takes a long time to read this. It takes even longer to learn it. So how do you get the essence of the Gemara? One way is you can go to dafachayim.org and get a very nice diagram, right? Which tells you the different opinions of Abaya and Rava, right? And we know that the halacha is like Rava. This is what we do. We do yayin kiddush ner habdallah zman. That's the order of the brachot, right? Or you can spell them out or you could do it in a picture. Now, by now, many people know this. It's not such a surprise to see that yak the acronym Yak Nahaz can be represented in visual format. So here, the first letters of each component spelled out Yak Nahaz, which in German Yiddish, Yagdain Hazen, hunt the hares. And here is only one of many, many examples of a, a medieval Haggadah in which that acronym is translated into the visual motif of 
a hunter hunting the hares, right? Now, there may be other layers of interpretation. Is the hare the, the Jewish people who are under oppression in medieval society? Um, probably, right? Um, but at its essence, it's a mnemonic to help you remember Yaknahaz, that this is what you do. And so this year, if you didn't know it already, on, on the, at the first Seder, you'll be able to um, remember Yaknahaz. Okay. Now, I, it should be clear that all of the Haggadahs we've been looking at are luxurious items, right? To have a, to have a um, handmade, an illustrated book means you are a person of some means, right? And, you know, we have to remember that, you know, first of all, up until the year 1300, certainly, you know, th th nobody had a Haggadah at the Seder. It was all done this way, mouth and ears, right? And then around the year 1300, they start to make individual Haggadahs. But even then, how many were at the table? One. You know, one, the one person had it. Now, was it the Baal Habayit? Was it the Baal um, I, That Again, that's a different, uh, that's a different lecture. And that's any Haggadah. Then you start adding pictures. It's a luxurious item. So the any Jew, whether it's the, whether it's the second Nuremberg Haggadah um, um, or here, the so-called Lombard Haggadah because it comes from Lombardy, from Milan around 1390. These are very well-to-do Yidden, right? And, and, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't think that every Jew throughout the entire Middle Ages was persecuted and suffered. Okay. Uh, we should also not forget that many were persecuted and suffered, but at, at least these Haggadahs tell a, a slightly different story. All right, so here um, we, uh, I, I, I'm gonna take you right to a particular image in this Haggadah, which is going to, now if you thought if you thought, uh, you know, Gershom's bris mila was uh, unexpected, I think the next thing is going to be even more expected. I, I hope you're sitting down. I, I, I can only see a couple of people, but I assume you're all sitting down. In this Haggadah, you come toward the end and you have a picture of a man slaughtering a pig. What? Yeah, that's what it is. And I, I don't want to put I don't want to put any anyone particular on the spot, but you know, has anyone ever seen a pig in a Haggadah before? Good. If you did, I'd be a little worried. Um, and you know, your your your, your buy it membership might have to be revoked. <laughs> I, I don't know if anyone on the membership committee is here, you know, monitoring people's Haggadah experiences. Um, all right, so what the, what is a pig doing in the Haggadah? So there are many ways to answer this question. So Jeremy says, well, maybe he was a non-Jewish artist. And in fact, that's almost certainly the case, but still, Jeremy, we have to imagine that when Mr. Uh, you know, you, you know, Gi Giuseppe de Rossi, right? A, a, a big Macher Jew in Milan in 1390, when he gets his Haggadah and he opens it up and he's turning the pages and he gets to Yishtabach here and he sees a pig being slaughtered. Is he going to say, Oi, Gewalt, that non Jewish artist did me a dirty turn? He slipped this in and I didn't know and now I'm so upset and what am I going to do and how can I get my money back? No, we have to imagine. And there are, uh, frankly, there, there are scholars, there are medieval art historians who think that that's exactly what happened. That Jeremy says, you know, the, the non-Jewish artists just did what they wanted and the Jews took it, right? And, and you know, maybe the non-Jewish artists slipped in kind of nasty messages, that, right? And either the Jews didn't care or they didn't even notice or whatever. You know, I, I don't think we would believe it of ourselves, you know, 
if, if we buy something and we put it in our house, you know, we like to think we know what we're getting. So even if it's the non-Jewish artist, they still, it still has to make sense within the context of the Haggadah, right? All right, so, 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 so where does it fit in? So it comes during Hallel, right? And here's the first page of Hallel, uh, and not the first page of Hallel, within the Hallel, at the end, after the meal, um, right? And Jeremy is certainly, oh, a non-Jewish owner. I only know of one case in the entire history of the Middle Ages, which you know lasts hundreds of years, in which there is an illustrated Haggadah made for a non-Jewish, made Dafka for a non-Jewish owner. And then I, I can name you one or two examples in the 17th century when bibliophiles would just buy illustrated Haggadot as, as a kind of collector's item. But um, I don't think this is such a case as I hope to show. Um, it's certainly the, the Jew who owns this is acting as a noble individual, right? And you know, the, the figures in here you know, have an elegance to them um, that suggests that the Balabias is, is someone of real status, right? But the question I'm asking is what we call an iconographic one. What, what's the meaning of this image and why is it there? So we put it in the context of the whole Haggadah it's in the second part of Hallel after the Suda, after the meal, right? And it's uh, from, it's Psalm 136, Kuf Lamed Vav, which is very long, right? And here at the very beginning, we see a man beneath the rainy sky. You say, huh, what's that? Good question. Here's the second opening. Here's a man warming himself by the fire, and here's a man pruning the trees. So now you're getting a sense that there's a sense of, of agriculture, of temperature, right? You've got the elements here, the rainy sky, right? It's beginning to sound seasonal, right? Here we continue through the psalm, right, which has the refrain, ki li alam chasdo, his mercy will endure forever, right, picking flowers, hawking, right, a, an aristocratic pastime. And to, to get to the punchline, these images are part of the standard repertoire of imagery in the Middle Ages for representing the months. Each month has a particular labor that's specific to that month, right? So when it's cold in February, you huddle by the fire. I don't have to expand on that for people in Toronto. In, in the spring, you go out hawking, right? I guess, I guess we would, you know, have, you know, you'd go out jogging, I guess, right? And of course, everybody knows that according to this, according to this uh, scheme, in December, what do you do? You kill your pig and you slaughter it and you put it away because that's just the, the seasonal activity and you're gonna need that food in January and February when you don't have so many crops. And you can see these images th throughout the, the width and breadth of medieval art. Here, I'm just showing you two examples, one in a church in Scandinavia, in modern day Sweden, you can see the same image of the man raising the ax to slaughter the pig. Here on the left is a manuscript from around 1200 where the same image is paired. It's on the calendar page of a private Christian prayer book for a uh, French aristocrat, a queen named Ingeborg, right? Um, and even in a machsor from the Worms community, which we know is dated exactly to 1272, where once again, this happens to be an appeal for 
Pesach, Mechusan Biyom Elim. Um, uh, I, I don't know if you say that, uh, if, I don't know if you still do Yotzros in, in the Bayat. Um, I, I don't know if it, you, you, you say this uh, particular piyut, but in the Middle Ages, they, they loved it. And here, once again, we have calendar ideas, the idea of, um, well, I hope I didn't give any, I hope I didn't give you any any ideas. Um, now here, at least they've changed the pig to an ox, right? So in this case, the illuminator was a little sensitive, but in 1390, they didn't do it. So now we get back to Jeremy's point about the artist. We know that the artist of Lombard Haggadah was from the workshop of this artist, Michelino de Basozzo, um, active in Milan, painted for the Duke of Milan. And you can see the similarities uh, in the, not only in the subject matter, but in the style, even in the page layout, right? And in a contemporary, you know, a book of hours made for a Christian noble person in Milan around 1390, just down the street, you know, there's a Jewish owner buying not a book of hours, but a Haggadah. The artist says, all right, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna represent things the way I, I know how, the way I'm familiar, but I'm still not, um, um, I'm still not willing to say that this is just done unbeknownst to the Jewish patron. Right, and so I think the answer uh, is right there on the page in front of us, right? Because it's not enough just to say, oh, that's how they did it, right? Somebody still had to have the Havamina. They still had to have the original idea. I'm gonna put these labors of the month in the Haggadah, which you should know is the only example we have of labors of the month in a Haggadah, as far as I know. So what, what's the answer? So if you look at the Capitol of Tehillim, right? If you read, now, I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on in that, it, you know, it's a long uh, thing, right? You could have painted a picture of Og, Melech Bashan, or Sihon, Melech Emori, right? But that's not what the artist chose. The artist chose the labors of the month. And the answer is up above, right? Because Hashem did great wonders. He made the heavens and the earth and the kochavim, the stars, and he made the sun, right? Et hayareach the kochavim l'mem shalot balayla, right? Right? Et hashemesh l'mem shalot bayom et hayareach the kochavim l'mem shalot balayla. The sun and the moon and the stars. He made the universe and it works in a timely fashion. And so when it comes to representing this thing, right? Our guy killing the pig happens to end up on the page with Ishtabach because you know there are 12 seasons and the Kapitel Tehillim is only so long, but the whole idea is how am I going to illustrate this Psalm, which speaks about many things. I'm picking out the idea that Hashem created the sun and the moon and the stars and the seasons and that everything is in perfect cosmic harmony. Um, and I, Reb Yid in Milan in 1390, I am not bothered by the image of the killing of the pig. I, it, it doesn't mean I'm going out and killing a pig and eating it at the Seder or in December or anything, but this is just how we show the seasons, right? Um, the same way, the same way, uh, and you know, this is not my example, but I like it very much. You know, we all, oh, you know, I can do, I can do it. Um, I think I can do it right now. Um, no, I would have to stop sharing. But you know, you can, you can put a smiley face on the Zoom, right? You, smiley face. Is it Jewish? Is it not Jewish? Is it a Goyish symbol? It's not. It's just. It's the symbol we all use. A smiley face. A yellow face, right? So similarly, um, Susan, I'd like to claim the, the, the honor of unveiling the mystery of the pig, but it doesn't mean I have people who, dis who don't disagree with me. Um, we, we can talk about that some other time. Um, but th this, is my, uh, this is my shot. This is my, my parshanut on it. Um, 
whether I'm right or not is up to everyone to, to decide. Now, I see that I've been blathering for 45 minutes. I wanted to tell the whole story of the Sarajevo Haggadah, which is very famous for so many reasons. Um, I'm going to take th this mamish, this picture could be a whole two hour lecture. I'm gonna try and do it in two minutes. And it all hinges, um, and you know, I'm probably gonna, I'm, I'm, if anybody wants, I'll give them a link to another lecture that I'm doing tomorrow night, where I, I will be talking more about the image of the Seder in the Sarajevo Haggadah, or I could send you my article on the subject. Basically, the, 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 the kasha is, the question is, who is this dark-skinned woman at the Seder table? Here's the Balabayat. Here's the Baalbite's wife, probably her. Here's one son, here's a second son, here's a daughter. It's a rich table. He's reclining as he's supposed to be. He's drinking his kos of yayin, right? He's performing all the mitzvos. They're also participating. There's a long, long history of speculation on who this figure is. The picture is part of a richly illustrated Haggadah, um, which includes um, all kinds of scenes. I'll just, I'll stop at this one, Maka, the plague of darkness, because I, you know, it's so good for people like us, right? Um, how, how do you represent darkness visually? Okay, so here, these people are in darkness. So those are the Egyptians. And here are the Jews who are not in darkness. But how do we know that they're not in darkness? What can they do that the Egyptians can't do, right? And leaving out, all, I mean, there are all kinds of midrashim about what happened during the plague of darkness. But the artist here has chosen to highlight what activity? Reading. Reading, right? The Jews have their books. They can read. That's how you know they have light. I just, I, is that so fantastic or what? Um, okay, so th they're all the, they're all, right? All right, here's, here's um, uh, Matan Torah, um, I, and, and there's the Beit HaMikdash, Shia Bane Beit HaMikdash, Bim Herav Yamenu. Here's the contemporary synagogue. There's so much to talk about here. Here's the text pages. Finally, Pesach, Matzah, and Maror. And ultimately, we finally get, right, like everybody's like, finally, ah, we're, we're at the meal already. Okay, so here's the picture um, of the, of the family at the Seder. And, you know, the woman, the woman is dark. She's clearly dark. And everyone, scholars have always said, well, she's a slave, right? But the usual interpretation is, oh, isn't it nice that the slave is at the Seder table? But I, 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 I wasn't comfortable with that. And I worked up a whole interpretation that basically, says, look, first of all, from an art historical point of view, if you compare the picture to other pictures, just like we did with the, with the um, Lombard Haggadah, we see that the conventions suggest otherwise because all the Cheshava people are behind the table and the servants are in front of the table and the servants are in profile. Profile is very bad in medieval art. It's very negative, right? No, none of the, none of these people, right? And it's not even, you know, visually, you know, so successful, right? You know, the, the, the modeling and the, the three-dimensionality, the artist is not the greatest artist in the world, but it's really important for him or her, but probably him to show more of the face of the Jews. They're important, right? She's not, she's definitely not a first-class citizen. And if we look at other Spanish manuscripts from exactly the same time as the Sarajevo Haggadah, they're very sensitive to skin color and dark people are always negative people, right? So it's hard for me. So I'm starting from the visual point of view saying it, it's not so clear cut. And then if you go to the texts, you go to all of the rabbinic literature right, from Spain, from the year 1300, 1320, you know, we know historically Jews own slaves, 
And we know that the Rabbanim were very worried about slaves because, you know, men didn't always behave themselves with their slave women. And, you know, the Ramban, right, his son goes off to court and the Ramban tells his son, really be careful of those Arab women. They're very dangerous. They're very seductive, right? And the Rashba has all kinds of, um, uh, uh, there's a, a whole, all these shoot, these responsa about uh, the halakhas of men and women and their slave women. But the, the, the thing that I want to focus on is a passage in Rambam, in his laws of Passover, that like, you know, I'd seen it, but I like, it wasn't until I looked at the picture that I went, oh, 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 oh. So here's what the Rambam says, right? He's talking about the Talibanecha, you shall inform your sons. And what he says is you should do it according to the son's knowledge, right? Which is good pedagogical uh, approach, right? If the son is young or foolish, you say this thing, but if he is wise, you tell him this other thing, right? But look what happens when you highlight the words of the Rambam. He says, Um, he says, uh, oh, I've, I've kind of covered it up here, right? But, uh, sorry, but he says, zeh, this slave, right, here it is. Shifcha zo okomo eved zeh. This slave, this maidservant. And it's like he's, you know, zeh, right? Ba'avor zeh. It jumps out. It's like, you see, you see Fatima over there, my son? That's what a slave is. We are free. So I think that unfortunately, the Sarajevo Haggadah does not tell us such a happy story about uh, the slave at the Seder table. I mean, there are other things in here about reclining and drinking and matzah and right slaves having a chiv to eat matzah but not drink wine. Anyhow, um, if you want to know more about that, uh, I, I can send you my article or send you a link to another lecture. Now, let me just end because I'm I, I'm really pushing it here, but I want to just show a couple of pictures to assure you that this is not that parish pictures as parish is not only a medieval phenomenon, right? Here is a uh, Haggadah made by a French artist in 2001, uh, Gerard Gahus, searching for the Afikomen. Again, I love sharing some of my favorites. Again, I'd never heard of this guy. I didn't know this Haggadah until I started doing the research, right? This is searching for the Afikomen. What's, what's notable about this page? Upside what down. You, it's upside down, exactly. What? So I think for me, the message is, you know, and not only is it upside down, but the guy's head is in his body and he's peering, it's, it's bizarre. Right, it's really strange. It's topsy turvy, and for me, you know, my shot on this, the way I interpret it, is that the artist is telling us, you know what, the whole business with the Afi Komen, it's topsy turvy. It's really bizarre, right? Um, I mean, you know, you have to steal the Afi Komen and you have to ransom it in order to fulfill the mitzvah. It's like imagine, right? Imagine if we had a a, a a men hug, you have to steal the Lulav and you have to steal the Esrig before you do the mitzvah of Lulav and Esrig, right? And you have to ransom the Esrig. You'd say you're crazy, right? But here we're saying we this is exactly what we would do with the Afi Komen, and you know, we just do it, right? Um, but Garust is saying, think about it for a moment, it's upside down. So I think the picture really makes you sit up and take notice. Um, David Moss, uh, famous, uh, really tremendous contemporary Jewish artist, made a uh, uh, Haggadah, which connects to the past. And here is his picture for Chameitz, which he looks at the de he takes the wheat, right? And he takes the um, Hilchos from the Rambam and breaks down the wheat into ultimately its mitochondrial DNA structure and talks about, you know, how you have to be so precise about searching for chametz. Um, 
you know, it, it's very deep and thoughtful or um, perhaps a little more accessible is his page for Bechol Dor Vador Chai Vadam Lirot Etat Smo Ke'ilu Hu Yatsami Mitzrayim. Everyone should see themselves as if they went out of Egypt. And what does he do in his picture? He puts little mirrors, right? And he has historical Jews that go all the way from the ancient past through the Middle Ages and into the present interspersed with these mirrors so that you could literally see yourself. Um, it's, a, it's a visual pun on the words. Okay, I'm gonna skip the Mark Podwal Haggadah and end, right? We have to end the Haggadah with Lashana Hababi Yushalayim. So I'll show you a, a medieval example or a Renaissance a, a, a Haggadah from the time of the Achronim, uh, still from Germany and one from modern Germany uh, in the early 20th century, Lashana Habab Yerushalayim, right? Many of us feel this way at the end of the Seder here, the Balabayat is drinking the last cup of wine, the sun is still animated, the wife has her Haggadah, right? Which gets back to um, the point we had earlier about feminist views. I don't wanna start using labels, but clearly, the visual evidence shows us that at least some women in the Middle Ages used Haggadahs at the Seder. Um, but you know, you could have stopped the you could have stopped the picture right there, and it would have made the point. But instead, the artist stretches it out and lets us know that the very next step is the comfy bed that's waiting for them. And here in um, Otto Geismar's just delightful Haggadah, we see the same idea of people exhausted at the end of the Seder falling asleep at the table. I hope I haven't exhausted you. I don't see too many people slumped over uh, the table, although, you know, maybe we should have some wine and say Um, Let me close by wishing you all a Chag Sameach. I've given you my email address there. You can get it from um, Michelle or, or the Bayit. The reason I give that to you is because I want to remind you that Signs and Wonders, 100 Haggadah Masterpieces, is a wonderful resource to enliven and enrich your Seder experience. And it's chock full of goodies of the sort that I presented tonight. And if anybody wants a copy, I, I'm selling it to you directly, cheaper than you can get from Amazon. And when you get it from me, it comes with a signature or a dedication. Um, and I'll be happy to make a personal delivery uh, to you if you are in Toronto. If you're anywhere else, I'm afraid you'll have to do it the Amazon way. But you have my email address if you have questions. I'm going to stick around here uh, for, for a while. Um, uh, sorry if I um, push too, too long, but I will stay as long as anybody wants to ask questions, or you can send me an email and we'll continue the conversation offline. I'm done with the formal presentation. Thank you so much, Professor Cohen. This lecture was so fascinating and interesting. And certainly uh, many of the, uh, the pictures that, that you gave us as examples, we can certainly uh, use and bring to our Seder tables and, and enhance our Sedorum this year with the Perushim that you gave us. Um, I know there are a few questions, uh, one, um, does anybody have any questions for the professor this evening? Can I make it, can I, just a quick thing. Last year, sure. when before the pandemic, when Michelle wanted to bring you to the shul, she expressed so much excitement about your work, so much. And then the pandemic came and now we're a year later and we had the salute to hear you. It must be such a pleasure to be sitting at your own center. Like I could just imagine how lucky the people are to sit at your center and get from your wisdom and your art knowledge. And you, thank you for sharing it. it. It felt like it went in a second, this, the lecture. So thank you. Yeah. All right. I, 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 I think um, I, I better start a fan club because someone's going to be the president there. I'm so grateful to you for those kind words. It's uh, the yeah. only way I know how to respond is to joke because it, it's very moving. And, you know, again, I feel like the, the, this, this is mine to talk to the Bayat. And, you know, 
we say Lashan Abab Yushalayim, but you know, if if we don't have the merit to be in Yushalayim next year, I would be happy to come up to the Bayit and do a completely different lecture and um, you know, further the relationship between the well, Bayit we, and the Kiver. Yes, uh, Professor Cohen, remember last year we were gonna have a Hagada road show as part. And actually, um, my husband actually took out a Haggadah uh, that he, did you want to ask him a question? Yeah. Oh, very, very interesting uh, talk. It was uh, really fascinating. Uh, one of the things that I was wondering, it seems that a lot of the um, imagination, uh, as far as illustrations were there in the earlier pre-printed Haggadah, and then maybe in more modern times, but like I have a Haggadah here. Um, you probably, I don't know that much about it. It's this one here. I don't know if you can see it. It's a little hard to make. You know, I, I think we're... It's, it's one of the, it's from 1710, one of the uh, um, Amsterdam. I think it's a copy of the Amsterdam Haggadah. But if I look at the illustrations, they're very, um, like one of the early printings where they did a lot of the illustrations from an earlier Haggadah that was printed a few years earlier. And the illustrations to me are very um, like unimaginative. They are, they're basically dealing with the shots and there's a little caption underneath. And, and it, it's quite different from the fascinating illustrations that Okay, you, so yeah. I, obviously I picked out really juicy things. Right. Um, <laughs> but I would challenge you now with your new eyes to go back and look at that slowly, carefully, you know, you got to work it around. I, you know, I don't want to say it's, it's like a Rashi or a Tosvos, but you know, Lahav deal, you see that there, there are hidden things there that, that if you pay attention to might open up levels of interpretation. And I think I don't want to judge it without seeing it in person. So let's hold it off until next year. Believe that there will have a chance to look at it together, and then we can. Um, I mean, the Amsterdam Haggadah. I, I, you know, I've written a whole article just about the Amsterdam Haggadah. It's fascinating. It's um, w we could spend a long time talking about it. So we're just going to have to suspend our gratification. <laughs> okay. uh, I I have a question, um, Professor. Um, did the artist um, read Hebrew to know what uh, picture to put in what spot? Like, or did somebody tell them the story and then they interpreted what was appropriate or inappropriate at, uh, places? The answer is yes. And what I mean by that is you have to look at each example and judge it on its own merits. And sometimes it's clear that the artist is a Jew who's informed and understands the text and knows things beyond the text, um, the Haggadah text itself. Other times it may be Jew or, or as we saw, certainly I think it, it's 99% sure that in the case of the Lombard Haggadah, it's a non-Jewish artist. So clearly some Yid has to be involved in the production. Cause you know, I just showed you a couple of pictures, but you know, if you look at the thing as a whole, it's clear that the pictures connect to the Haggadah, right? And just, you know, you know, Giovanni, the artist doesn't know the Haggadah, right? He's just a craftsperson, right? He knows how to paint. So, so this is one of the questions that art historians spend endless amounts of time arguing about. Too much time, frankly. You know, was the artist a Jew? Was there the advisor a Jew? Right? Who, who did forty percent? Was eighty percent of the conception? Sometimes we can say with confidence what the answer is. Sometimes we just really don't know. So that's why I gave you a cheeky answer by just saying yes. Because <laughs> gam bagam, as we say in Hebrew. Thank you. Yashikoach. Bruchtia. 
Are there also um, Sephardic Haggadot? Like, I mean, most of those you were showing were more of the Ashkenazic tradition. Would there? Did you review those? Did you see those with illustrated okay. Haggadot and the Sephardic? So, so, so the Sarajevo Haggadah is Sephardic. It's from Barcelona, probably, and there are many, many from Iberia. Now, in terms of Svardim from Edut HaMizrach, not so much, in part because, again, and, and again, I, I think it's, it's, uh, um, uh, uh, what's, what's not obvious, but it's latent in what I presented that clearly the Jews who wanted these illustrated Haggadot were part of a broader culture, the same way we are in Toronto. And they do some things that their non-Jewish neighbors do, like have fancy picture books, right? Um, you know, but in Yemen in the 16th century, under Islamic rule, you know, there's not the same tradition of figural books. That's not to say there are none, right? But it's a different historical context that doesn't favor this kind of production. So it is very much, at least in the Middle Ages, a European phenomenon. But you know, then as the world changes into the 17th, 18th, 19th century, and you get printing, and you get more, you know, it becomes more of a global market, right? It doesn't just happen in the 20th century or 21st century. Um, then you do start to get things from throughout the world and you know things just explode in the 20th century a after the industrial revolution and so on and so forth you, you know where you can find a good overview of all of this signs and wonders 100 Haggadah masterpieces <laughs> yeah there we go thank you elaine Does anyone else, uh, are we still being recorded? On signs and wonders for people wondering what it is. There's um, illustrations from a hundred different Haggadahs and one side will have the Haggadah, um, a close up of part of it and then um, information about the Haggadah and it comes from different parts of the Seder. It goes from the oldest to, to more recent ones and it's really an excellent book. There's a more recent one. Is, is the Haggadah really the only Jewish text that gets illustrated as much? I mean, we obviously don't illustrate a Sefer Torah and um, a Megillah, like, you know, the, in the actual text isn't illustrated. But here we are working with the Haggadah and it's so, we have so many examples of illustrated Haggadah. Is it fairly unique in the Jewish tradition to have an illustrate, um, you know, we don't have a Machzor typically that's illustrated you know we open up a machzor for the high holidays we don't see illustrations oh, is it i have anything to do with but he got to like it's a children yeah, you know, something yeah, to create yeah. children is that connected yes I, I i would say though that one one of the things i've learned as a historian is to use words like yeah. unique and typical with real caution because you know the historical record is very long and human experience is very diverse and it's really hard to say that something is unique so i i think tip i'm i'm, I'm more comfortable with typical and i think you're absolutely right that the hagada doesn't come with the same level of kadusha that uh, Sefer Torah has, um, and, you know, certainly, although I, I, I have seen like pseudo Sifre Torah that are illustrated. I mean, they're not obviously for use in, in shul, but, um, but those are modern things. So the Haggadah does lend itself and certainly the nature of the text as a narrative, although you know, if you think about it, as I'm sure you have, you know, it's the Haggadah is a really funny way to tell the story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, 
right? It's not a simple narrative. And I mean, that's one of the reasons why the, the um, Haggadah illustrators do all kinds of um, things to grapple with, with that fact. But as Leon says in the chat box, you do find starting in the 17th century, uh, many illustrated um, Migilot Esther, but even in the Middle Ages, there are many illustrated machzorim, not private individual machzorim, but community machzorim. Um, you can find many different kinds of things illustrated, but the Haggadah is far and away the most popular thing to illustrate because you know you use it every year. Look, we have from the 17th century illustrated Mayo books. Really? Yeah. Right? But you know, let's face it, how often are you going to use that? Right? So, you know, the Haggadah comes every year and it's a story. Mm -hmm. And there could be that aspect of getting the children interested. But again, I hope that one of the things I've shown you, and you know, I have a slide that I use in some lectures um, where I compare the art scroll, the, the art scroll Haggadah that I myself use, and the art scroll children's Haggadah, which has pictures. And the implication there is that pictures are for kids, right? Kids need pictures. We, we don't need pictures. But I hope that I've convinced you that pictures can be very sophisticated and they can add tremendous amount of value and, and e even learning to the text of the Haggadah and the experience of the Seder and that it may work on one madrega for the kids, but there are other higher madregas that you can get um, more out of. So I, again, I encourage you all to think in these next couple of weeks, you know, what Haggadahs do I have on the shelf over there that I never take out, you know, because, you know, again, for the same reason that I use the Art Scroll Haggadah, you know, when I have in non-COVID times, when I have 10 people around, I want everyone to have the same Haggadah because not everyone, you know, knows their way around the Haggadah. Um, so I don't want everyone to have, this one has the Amsterdam Haggadah and this one has the Lombard Haggadah and this one has the Sarajevo Haggadah, right? And not every minhag is the same, right? Because some of the minhagim in, in uh, Ashkenaz are different from the ones in Svarad, right? So um, it's easier, but you know, sometimes easy is not always the most interesting. And so, you know, I encourage you, go, go take that you know, yes, you've got the Haggadah with the parish of the Malbim. And I would never tell you not to use that, right? But go take one of those others off the shelf and say, hey, what do these pictures do? What can they add? Um, let's talk about it, right? I um, recently, in the last couple of years, what I do is when I, again, when I have people, I, I take um, photocopies of different pictures from my book and I hand and everyone gets a different one. And when it's their turn in the Seder, they have to say what's going on in the picture, what do they think is happening, what is the artist trying to tell them, and um, it, it's good for stimulating conversation. And the great answer is, you really can't get it wrong. You know, yeah, when you're talking to me, I, you say, oh, it, 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 it's a picture of a coat of arms, and I say, no, it's not really a coat of arms, right? But if you're just sitting at your Seder, right, let everyone have their parish, and you know, it's, it's, how cold to say there? Does anyone else need a drink? Well, just a just a little comment, if I may. First of all, I you it was a great talk. And thank you, Isaac. Thank you very much. Um, in the Middle Ages, one would expect that all the all the uh, illustrators would be non-Jewish because Jews were forbidden to make any images of anything that's in the heavens above or the earth beneath. Isn't that so? Well, I... even, even in the in the in, I noticed that in the, um, the second point is I noticed that even when there wasn't an illustration. It had to be a, a, a non-Jewish uh, person that was doing that, that part of it, because the um, the the monthly tasks, the December was the killing of the pigs, 
in November was collecting acorns for the pigs. But there wasn't an illustration. They just showed you collecting the, uh, the acorns, but no pigs, of course. Right. So again, I, I'm very wary of words like all. And it, it's true that in perhaps even most circumstances, Jews were not involved in trades like artistry, painting, but that doesn't mean that some weren't. And there are some cases of these Haggadot where, or, or other illustrated books where it's pretty clear that they were Jewish artisans and they had to have gotten their training somewhere. Now, there's also, let's keep in mind, there are good artists and there are bad art artists. You know, some of them are not so good. Some of them are pretty good. They had to have gotten their training somewhere. So, and clearly the basic issue of the second commandment, right? You shall have no gods, no graven images before you. Traditionally, we have thought, oh, well, that means Jews didn't have art, right? But you know, you just look around your own house, you know that's not true. Um, and it wasn't true in the Middle Ages, it wasn't true in the 17th century. It, it, it wasn't, you know, there are plenty of um, uh, synagogues in Israel from the fourth century with mosaic pavements with images in them. In places like Sipori, Sepphoris, where we know there were great Rabbanim, Right now, did every great rabbi in the time of the Mishnah and the Gemara daven in a synagogue with a painted, you know, a, a mosaic floor? I don't know. Some definitely no, some definitely, some maybe yes, but the things exist, right? The Lombard Haggadah was used by a Jew. The Sarajevo Haggadah was used by a Jew. They clearly had no problems having pictures which means probably they, there were some Jews who didn't mind painting them. And there are plenty of rabbinic responsa that wrestle with the question, can you paint? Can you not paint? Can you paint like this? Can you paint like that? And you know, there are ways, there are ways to do it. So I think I showed enough evidence to demonstrate that it was done. In any particular case, we have to look carefully and, and weigh, weigh the issue on its merits and say yes, no, or maybe, or we don't know. But I, I would never say all or never. I would never say never. And you can quote me on that. Thank you. Okay, I think we should close it now. Yes, I think we're gonna wrap it up. So thank you everybody for coming. Professor Cohen, once again, Yashar Koach, the lecture was incredible. The hour and a half flew by. It was so interesting. And I'm really, um, I'm certainly gonna be more cognizant of the pictures in the Haggadot uh, that we, we look at in the next few weeks in preparation for Pesach. And Professor Cohen, we, I'm certainly, many of us will be interested in the articles you mentioned that expand on other topics like the Amsterdam or the Sarajevo Haggadah. And um, yeah, your link to the other lecture you might be giving that's a slightly different talk. Uh, yes, I'll be, you know, if anyone's interested, send me an email. Perfect. Okay, okay I'll look forward to hearing from you. Great. Thank you again. Have a good night, everybody. Zeigesint. I, I would like to engage in some banter, but I see we're still live on YouTube. So I'm, yeah. I'm worried about being too informal. Well, maybe Rabbi Karab can, can stop the tape.
I know Mark is waiting, ready to pounce on me. 